What's up guys, Jake here from Turn Modern. Today, we're gonna to teach you how to make this butcher block, all the tips and tricks you need to know. Also, it's our very first video launching our new brand on YouTube. Jump down, hit that subscribe button. Let's go. So we're gonna jump right into it. Uh, we've obviously already jointed our wood, planed our wood flat. Uh, this board's gonna be about an inch and a half thick, so I like to keep everything squared. So the first rip I'm gonna make is about 40 millimeters, which is just over an inch and a half. But since we're not planing too much down here, that'll work good for this first pass. Um, we're gonna cut enough wood to make this first blank roughly 17 inches in width and probably about 32 inches in length. Something to keep in mind here, don't cut yourself short. Uh, this butcher block's gonna be about 16 inches so I'm gonna cut and make sure I'm at 17 inches. If you cut it right at 16 inches, you're taking a chance of having, having a flat spot after we cut the circle out. So definitely go bigger, not right on the 16 inch mark. So I'm going about 17 inches here. All right, so we're ready for the glue up now. Uh, we're gonna rotate each block 90 degrees, so now the edge grain is up and down rather than the base grain. Um, something to take into consideration here when you're doing the glue up. Uh, a lot of people use the wrong roller. Uh, you need to use a cabinet roller. The roller should feel like a sponge. Uh, also, it won't leave a bunch of uh, frays and hairs from the actual roller itself. So use the sponge-like roller. It's called a cabinet roller. You can give it any big box store. Another glue up tip. Um, a lot of people I see they're squeezing the glue as hard as they can. They're going back and forth trying to get the glue out of there. If you just remove the actual cap itself, the cap I'm talking about is the one you slightly push up and the glue comes out of it. Just remove that entire cap so that all you have left is the green top on the glue bottle, you'll get much more glue to come out of that bottle much easier, trust me. For clamps, clamps are pretty simple. Um, small tricks will save you a lot of time on the next portion, a lot of times sanding or planing, depending on which one you're gonna use next. Uh, for me, I'm gonna use a drum sander because I don't have a plane this big. Uh, you can go down in the middle like I'm doing right now, kind of just level everything up, make sure it's as even as possible. If you have too many gaps, high or low, you're gonna be sanding for much, much longer. Um, after you get this one level, and you go to your, uh, your next end, I'm gonna show you a little trick here with a smaller clamp and how to move one block up and down depending on what you need. So here all I'm doing is I'm taking this clamp, putting it in between two blocks, and just pull back on it slightly. It'll pop the lower block, lower block up and uh, even it all out for you pretty easy. I see a lot of guys using, you know, three or four calls and 20 clamps, and I just don't think it's necessary. Keep it there, it's all even, tighten it up, and it'll stay right where it's at, I promise. You can do that for both sides. As far as clamp spacing, I usually do on something this size, three on one side, two on the other. Um, it's not gonna be perfect, but if you're roughly 200 millimeters apart, you're gonna have pretty even clamping pressure throughout this blank and it's gonna work just fine for you when you do your cross cutting. One final glue up tip before you set your board up to dry. Wipe the glue off. It'll save you a little bit of time at the end. If you forget to do it, it's no worries. You grab a paint scraper and you just scrape it off. It's all dry. It'll come right off. After a couple hours, the glue's dry. Uh, I bring it over to my drum sander. I'm using 80 grit sandpaper. I keep the 80 grit on there until about the end when I start to do finish sanding. Uh, keep in mind, 
something big here is I only do two passes on each side and then I rotate it to the next side. If you start doing more than two passes per side in a row, you take the chance of your board starting to warp a little bit because it's getting too hot on one side. So I do two, two passes on the top, two passes on the bottom, and I just keep flipping it back and forth, two passes each, until my board's nice and smooth. Once we're finished with the drum sanding, we're going to break out the crosscut sled. Uh, yes, I have had plenty of homemade crosscut sleds, but I promise you nothing beats something like this. Uh, no, I'm not sponsored, but I do use the, I think it's the Inker 5000. I love it. Perfect 90 every time. Uh, honestly, it's just it saved me a bunch of time. So now I'm just going to cut a flat side so that when I um, start to ingrain the board, I have a smooth side to start with on the rift fence. Now I adjust my fence. Uh, I'm going to adjust it to 42 millimeters. So it's about two millimeters bigger than when I started the original blocks. Um, the reason being, I'm going to do a lot more sanding on the end grain than I did on the edge grain blank. So I want two more millimeters uh, for the drum sander, especially since we're using the CNC machine. I'm going to drum sand twice and then do a bunch of hand sanding after that. Big takeaway here, remember earlier we went about 17 inches on the width. Uh, we don't want to short this side either, so I think I went to about 17 and a half on this side. Uh, it was perfect. Uh, right after that, I always take everything back to the drum sander and I sand the edges down. Uh, the saw always frays the edges. I sand all that down so that when I go to finish my board on the glue up, I don't have a bunch of cracks and gaps that I have to come back with glue and dust and fix up later on. Everything fits together perfect, just like it should. All right, on to the end grain glue up. This is where we make our money. Now, there's two two big things right here in this in this uh, portion. Uh, the first thing is, and you're going to see me do it is change your pattern. Turn every other block 180 degrees and change the pattern. Customers love when their pattern is unique to them and everything doesn't look the same. They love this, so change the pattern. Number two, you must put two pieces of hardwood on the top and the bottom of your end grain glue up. The reason for this is if you do not do that, your board will start to warp up and down on the top and the bottom and you will ruin your project. If you try to sell this to a customer after they've already paid for it and they see that, they're not going to be happy. I promise you. Make sure you put wood on the top and the bottom. That will save you so much money in the long run, I promise.
After a couple hours and the glue up, uh, you're ready for the drum sander again. I still have 80 grit sandpaper. I have not changed that. Um, remember, two passes on each side. I do it the same way every time, no matter what I'm doing here. Two passes on the top, two passes on the bottom. Keep flipping it over, two passes only. This will keep you from warping your board. If you warp your board, you have to play the unwarped board game, and nobody likes to play that game. All right, guys, time for the hard part. Um, I'm sure if you're anything like me, you've had a lot of trial and error with these machines. Um, I feel like I've gotten down pretty well at this point as far as ingrain inlays go, and I'm going to give you every single tip and trick that I can to make sure that this works for you every single time you do it. First thing I do here is a circle cut, the outer circle 16 inches with a quarter inch bit. Uh, just an easy profile cut. I only go down three quarters of an inch and then I use the bandsaw to cut the rest of it off and I'll show you that a little bit later. For the rest of this project, and for most of my projects, I use an eighth inch end mill for my clearance and a 60 degree V-bit. Uh, we can definitely get into talking about other types of V-bits, 22 degree V-bits, 15 degree V-bits, um, but for the most part, you're not going to have enough detail for something like that. A 60 degree is going to do the job every single time. So this is another ingrain cutting board, just a smaller one. If you're doing an ingrain inlay, you must use an ingrain plug to go on top of your main board. Now, you can't cross edge grain and ingrain. They will grow differently, differently and they'll eventually crack. So this is going to be the most important portion of the plug. All right. A lot of times when you're doing the plug, your bit tries to cut the entire portion out at the same time. Well, if you're like me, your CNC machine is belt driven. We don't have enough power and drive to keep it <clears throat> straight and accurate. So our projects a lot of times split and fray and splinter. 
So what I'm doing is, if you can see there, I put my probe on top of an eighth inch piece of wood. What that does is, now the machine's only going to cut halfway through this portion of the cut. And then I'm going to go back and reprobe directly on top of the plug and let it cut the rest of it out. That will keep it nice and clean and smooth cuts and you will have no issues after it's done. Here's the second cut, same bit, same exact cut, just no eighth inch block under the probe. So now it's gonna cut the same cut just all the way through the project. It'll come out real nice and smooth, no fray, no splinters. Now we move on to the V bit. We're gonna do the same thing. Eighth inch block under the probe on the first cut. After the first cut's done, we're gonna remove Put the probe back on the plug with no eighth inch block under it. So that's a total of four cuts. Two cuts on the eighth inch end mill bit and two cuts with the V bit. It takes a little longer, but your project comes out perfect every single time. Here I'm just cutting around the image that is going to be placed inside the cutting board eventually. All right, time for the glue up. We've got our plug cut out. We've got our pocket cut out of the cutting board. And now we're just gonna put a good amount of glue inside the pocket and uh, quite a bit of clamping pressure on our plug. Um, one thing to take into consideration here is when you, put, when you place the plug into the cutting board, you're gonna wanna put some type of hard wood on top of that so that when you tighten down your clamps, you don't break the ingrain wood. and you'll be able to keep even clamping pressure throughout your image. Because there's no airflow here, I always wait 24 hours before I unclamp these ingrain inlays. And I've never had any issues with something falling out or not staying in tight.
So since it's bigger than my bandsaw, uh, I just create my own tool path here. I use a, a quarter inch end mill bit and I just let the CNC machine do all the work here. Once we finish there, uh, we come over to the bandsaw, start to cut out our circle. Uh, then we move over to the router table with a flush trim bit, uh, even up the sides, and then we're really starting to see this thing take shape now. This is probably my second favorite part. Um, this is the portion where you sand that glue off, you really get this thing flat, and you can really see what it's gonna look like, and uh, it's always just amazing to see these projects start to turn out. Uh, I also changed my sandpaper finally, so I use 80 grit right there on that first couple, first couple passes. Now I'm changing to 150 because I know I'm getting really close to my finished sanding. All right, on this portion, we're done with the drum sanding. We went up to 150. Um, might sound a little strange, but I go, I start at 80 grit here on the palm sander. The reason I do that and the reason I go so slow right here is because I want to make sure at this point I get rid of the drum sandering marks. So often when I go to shows and stuff, I see drum sander marks all over these cutting boards because they feel flat and smooth, but they didn't take the time to get these marks out. If you want to sell your projects for high dollar, they have to look high dollar. Make sure you take your time on that 80 grit, get all those marks out, and then you can kind of just take off with the 150 and then 220 after that. And I promise you it'll be smooth, flat, and look absolutely perfect in the end. I like to raise the grain after I'm done with the 150 on the palm sander. Um, I also love to see what this project's gonna look like after I oil it. So right here you get your first glimpse. That's always nice. I usually let it sit about 20 minutes and uh, dry for the most part. And then I come with my 220 and finish off the sanding. Now it's time to dip the board into the oil. Uh, like everybody else, use food grade mineral oil. I usually leave it in here for about 30 seconds. I take it out and put it in another tub and let it dry overnight. As you can see here, uh, this thing looks absolutely amazing. It's time to finish it up. Um, I know that my board's perfectly square, so I just count the squares up and down so I can find my center line. All I have to do is measure down an inch and a half, drill a small hole, and do that all the way around the board. Uh, before I put the feet on, I actually like to wax the board first on the bottom, and then put the feet on, turn it over, and finish waxing the front. All right, everybody, that's the end of the video. Appreciate you watching. If you like the video, please hit the subscribe button. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. I promise to read each and every one of them. Thanks again.